guys, it's Reagan and welcome back to another video. Today's video is going to be my first reading wrap up of 2024. That's right, we are officially in the new year and I'm happy to report I have read some exciting books I am looking forward to chatting about today. And there's quite a few of them. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. The first two books I'm gonna show off, I technically did read in 2023, but I never filmed a wrap up they were included in. So I decided to include them in this video. I hope you do not mind. The first book is Two Twisted Crowns by Rachel Gillig. This of course is the sequel to One Dark Window. This is a very popular romance fantasy duology story that's set in kind of a dark fantasy world that's surrounded by this evil mist. In this world the magic system is centered around a deck of cards. If you hold a particular card you're imbued with that power. We follow our main character in book one who basically has like a monster living in her head and she gets wrapped up in conspiracy with some unlikely people. This has romance and magic and intrigue, lots of action, adventure, quests, and I would say in general in theory it has lots of stuff I would say I generally enjoy. The first book I will admit underwhelmed me. I liked it in theory. I liked the magic system, but I found the romantic pacing to just be off and I was never really compelled by the romance that centered that story, but I decided to give book two a try because everyone said this book was even better than the first one, but I do feel that similar problems I had with book one carried over into book two. I was compelled by the magic system. I don't dislike this world. I like the characters, but I simply put just didn't love anything. Like I liked a lot of stuff, but I just didn't love a lot of stuff. And I just was kind of waiting for the book to end if I'm being transparent. And in general, I would say the main issue I have with this series is pacing. The author is including a lot of really fantastic ideas, but I don't feel like any one thing is drawn out enough and everything sort of ends in a very expected fashion. And so because of that, I just wasn't like flipping the pages, totally addicted to the story. Yeah, when it comes to this book, I feel like I just sort of enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. And I would still recommend it if you feel like you're interested in this world and story, but I personally would give this book like a three, 2.75, five stars. Another book I wrapped up and completed in 2023 was Fool's Quest by Robin Hobb. This is the second book to the final trilogy within the realm of the Elderlings by Robin Hobb. The second book also to the Fits in the Fool trilogy. And I loved every single thing about this book. It also broke me in a million different ways and fashions. This final trilogy is incredibly intense and so unbelievable emotional. It's obviously also very hard to talk about in depth without spoiling stuff that's happened previously in the series, but this again centers our beloved characters, the Fitz and the Fool, who were introduced to in the very first trilogy in the Farseer world. Fitz as our main character is one we have spent a lot of time with. We sit very closely to his heart and to his emotions, and Fitz himself is a very brooding main character. He's also a character that has been through a lot and Robin Hobb really uses Fitz to explore the trauma of being a chosen one character within a fantasy setting. I love Fitz to death and following him on this quest within the story has been beautiful and heartbreaking in so many different ways. It's also, it also has me on the edge of my seat. I don't know how Robin Hobb continues to do it. Her ability to make a plot just like perfectly drawn out in a way that I am so unbelievably completely absorbed and on the edge of my seat, but also in pain while reading it is just top notch, top tier. This book was excellent. One of my favorite books of 2023. Five out of five stars easily. I love Robin Hobb so much. Now moving on to books that I completed in 2024. The first book I'm going to show off is Once Upon a Broken Heart by Stephanie Garber. Look at this cover. It is stunning. It's a UK edition for anyone wondering. This is a first book to a series by Stephanie Garber set in the same world as the Caraval books. I had not read the Caraval books before reading this book and you technically do not need to. I personally was not lost in any form and fashion, though I'm sure you do get additional world building and content text if you read the first trilogy first, but I would say it's unnecessary. But when picking this book up, I wanted to be delighted. I wanted to have a lot of fun and I wanted to have a romance with lots of twists and turns. And honestly, this book delivered in every way, shape and form. This was a blast. This is a fairy tale story in a book. It's silly and fun and not something I would say like to take super seriously, but all of the inputs just like kept me turning the pages. I had a smile on my face the entire time. But to take a step back, this book follows our main character, Evangeline 
Evangeline Fox. And Evangeline Fox at the beginning of this book has had her heart broken. The love of her life or who she thinks is the love of her life is marrying somebody else. So she decides to flee to the fate of broken hearts, which is kind of like a god in this world. There are gods who oversee like different things and the fate of broken hearts makes a deal with our main character that if she gives him three kisses of his choosing, will help heal her broken heart and make sure the love of her life falls in love with her no matter the cost. A variety of events happen from there, resulting in Evangeline Fox kind of becoming a local celebrity with lots of suitors sort of chasing after her. From there, she travels to a adjacent kingdom where she participates in kind of like a courting competition for the prince and all the while the fate of broken hearts is around and kind of pulling Evangeline in various schemes that he himself is involved in and you kind of see one what those schemes are and also two as these two characters grow closer with one another. This book was just a blast. It's written exactly like a fairy tale. It's just so charming and fun. I loved our main character so much. She's naive but in a way that I personally found to be very endearing. I loved The Fates of Broken Hearts. He was cute and charming and whimsical and a little bit vapid in such a fantastic way. And just seeing how the story progressed, I just truly had a great time. And I can't wait to check out book two. I'm definitely going to be completing this trilogy. It was just delightful. And I would give this book like a four out of five stars. The next book I read is This Is How You Lose the Time War. And I had seen this book like everywhere online. I feel like this is a very popular and well-loved book, but I personally did not know what to expect going into this. And I have to say, this has to be one of the more unique love stories I have ever read. And because of that, I truly would recommend this book to anyone. It's also not very long. And I feel like you would absolutely fly through it. This book is set in kind of like a sci-fi dystopian-esque setting. We're following our main characters Red and Blue and they are both like the best agents for each side of this time war that's been going on for who knows how long, perhaps since the beginning of time. Each side of this time war basically traverses time and space and basically maneuvers different situations to try to thwart the other party. And again, we're reading from the perspectives of both Red and Blue, who are the best agents from their respective sides in this time war. And these two agents begin to pass love letters back and forth between each other. And the contrast of both the letters that Red and Blue are writing, which I adore, they're just so simple and straightforward like getting to know each other, recounting their love, contemplating all different aspects of life, but those letters are consumed in the backdrop of like the most wild sci-fi space and time setting that you can imagine. Like Red is reading a letter in a battlefield where two civilizations just fought to the death. Blue might be reading a letter on like a faraway planet which is full of the most strange and beautiful creatures you've ever seen. So like these two things in combination just absolutely hooked me. But at the core, this book is a love story, but kind of encircling it with all of these other fantastical elements just really heightened the experience for me. I loved Red and Blue. I was rooting for them. This book was very windy, very strange. I had no idea really where it was going, but I loved the ride and I would highly recommend this book. I give this book like a 4.5, five stars. It was so good. Next up, I completed both a reread and a continuation of a series I feel like that's been haunting me for years, right friends? I finally read book one and book two of the Locked Tomb series. The first one being Gideon the Ninth and the second one being Haro the Ninth and I loved these books so much. First and foremost, I have read Getting the Ninth now three times. There was a cycle I found myself stuck in for a rather long time where I would read Getting the Ninth, love Getting in the Ninth, and then forget everything that happened in Getting the Ninth so I never felt like I could continue on with the rest of the series. But lo and behold, folks, I have finally broken the cycle with this reread of Getting the Ninth. But to take a step back, this series is set in kind of a fantasy sci-fi mix. It's set in space and there's essentially these different planets where different houses of people live on them and each planet has their own specialty and necromancy. In book one, we're introduced to our main character, Gideon. She has been trying to get off her planet called Ninth House her entire life. And she strikes a deal with her arch nemesis on this planet, Haro, after Haro receives summons to enter this competition to become a lighter um, against all the other houses in the universe. And everyone's traveling to first house to participate in this. Gideon basically helps Haro become a Lysiter. She gets her freedom. From there, we follow these two characters as they not only begin to work more closely with one another, and there's a lot of humor there as they begrudgingly become 
friends and confidants, but also the mystery of first house is bizarre. It very quickly spirals from like a competition to a whodunit murder mystery, like just trying to survive what's happening. And the inputs of getting the ninth are just honestly delightful, but also very, very dark and violent. And the mystery was absolutely like so fun to piece together. And yes, I read it for the third time this month, really enjoyed it, would give it 4.5 out of 5 stars. But for the first time ever, I finally continued on with the series and I read Haro the Ninth. And I'm glad I read these two books back to back because Guinea in the Ninth, I would say in general, is a book that you really have to pay attention to because it can get confusing, like how the author does world building and just relays facts and information to us, the reader. Haro the Ninth is even more confusing, but like in all the ways I love, I was reading this book and I was like, I don't even know what's really happening. But to be fair, we're not supposed to know what's happening. And our main character, Haro, also does not know what's happening. And just sort of piecing together this very murky, strange sort of plot experience was a blast I love. Something else I'll say, the sequel, Haro the Ninth, is very different in tone than the first book, Gideon the Ninth, which makes sense because we are centering a new main character and the events of Gideon the Ninth are very much influencing that tone of this book. I personally really appreciated this adjustment and I also felt like it added to this sort of alien feeling while reading this book. You're reading all of these different events throughout the story and you also just have this sense of like something is very, very wrong and the author is clear clearly messing with you and your memory of previous events and also messing with our main character quite a bit. But like slowly as you begin to piece together this larger conspiracy, it is amazing. Not to mention in book two, we do get quite a bit more information about like the origin of this sci-fi fantasy world, some really important and powerful players, and also just get to know Haro the Ninth a bit more as well. I adored this book. I loved how just like absolutely along for the ride I was because I just simply could not anticipate anything that was happening and it was like a wonderful experience for me. Like personally speaking the decisions that the author made putting this book together I loved every single one of them and I would give this book five stars. I need to read Nona the Ninth soon especially because we don't want to restart that cycle of starting and stopping the series especially because I just feel like the more details you can hold on to, the faster you can read this series altogether, the better. Next book I was able to complete was A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Maas. I'd put off reading this book for a while, but with the upcoming release of Crescent City 3, I wanted to be up to date on all of the books in the Sarah J. Maas universe, if you will. Transparently, I went in with pretty like middle to high expectations because this fourth novel, set in the same world as Akatar, follows two characters that I personally really enjoy quite a bit, and that is Nesta and Cassian. Unfortunately for me, and there is a vlog sort of documenting the spiral that I experienced while reading this book, there was a lot of this book that I didn't mind, but there was also a lot more of this book that absolutely drove me bananas. Basically, this is a story that centers our main character, Nesta, who if you're familiar with this series, Nesta has gone through a lot and she currently at the beginning of the story is in a very dark and difficult place. She's self-sabotaging herself, self-sabotaging relationships of anyone who loves her because she feels personally she does not deserve that love. She's also coping with her PTSD and trauma with some very unhealthy coping mechanisms. And at the beginning of book one, her family sort of at a loss of what to do. So they sort of move her to another location to begin training with Cassian and hopes that she will sort of find herself again. Here's the deal. I like Nesta. I enjoyed Nesta's journey, her emotional journey, her growth. But what I did not enjoy in this book was the romance because I just feel like there honestly wasn't a lot of romance and it made me really sad. I otherwise really enjoyed Cassian when I encountered him in other stories, but I found following him in this book to be very underwhelming and I would just say the first book of this book I liked and the last part of this book I liked, the middle part really dragged. It's very, very smut heavy and it kind of got very repetitive for me and I just felt like there wasn't enough slow burn progress or will they won't they between their characters for my personal taste. So with that in mind, I just personally did not like this book very much at all and I would give it like a 2.5 out of 5 stars. Moving on, the next book I picked up was The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. I picked this book up one because I was kind of needing a palette cleanser after completing A Court of Silver Flames and I thought this sort of classic quest structured fantasy story would fit the bill. I'm happy to report that I 
really loved this book. Like, don't get me wrong, I will say the structure and just classic nature of the story is just something I personally tend to adore as a reader. And I can definitely see why this is considered like a must read if you're a fantasy lover. But in this story, we're introduced to our main character who is a unicorn. At the beginning of the story, she's living in her magical forest and she's very happy, but she overhears two humans discussing that if there's a unicorn living in this forest, as there seems to be, she would definitely be the last unicorn. Because no one has seen any unicorns roaming the land in ages. And the unicorn basically hears this and decides to set out on a quest herself to try to find others like her. Along the way, she runs into some unlikely characters who sort of join her alongside in her quest, overcome many obstacles, confront like the beauty of life and the horrors of life, and tries to save like her people, the other unicorns that are living within this space taking on like scary villains and ultimately just trying to save other unicorns just like her. I really enjoyed this book. First and foremost, I really loved the writing style. It was just so delightful and just perfectly encapsulates that like feeling of a tale being told to you. Like I felt like every time I picked this book up, I was sitting by a fire. Someone was like recounting like myth and lore directly to me. And I just felt so connected to the narrative style and quality of this book. I also just enjoyed the style of story itself. I feel like it really combined elements of humor, but still like heartbreak and emotion as well. I also really appreciate like in a true sort of myth tale style, like there are going to be positive and negatives that are sort of happening to our characters along the way. And the nature of fate itself is fickle. And I feel like Peter S. Beagle sort of captured that sentiment as well. But overall, this book was beautiful. I was truly delighted by it. I would highly recommend it. Honestly, when I finished it, I wanted to pick it up again and like read it again. I feel like when I read it for the second time in the future, I'm going to do it via audio. So I feel like this would lend so well to hearing it out loud. But yeah, I can see why so many people read this, loved this growing up, read it now and love it. It was truly like just a beautiful quest story. And I loved all of the characters, including the unicorn and some of the people that she collected along the way. It was delightful. And I would give this book like a 4.25 out of five stars. The next book I picked up honestly surprised me in so many different ways. And that is The Deep Sky by Yumi Kitasai. So many inputs of this book absolutely worked for me. I would describe it as like literary fiction meets sci-fi thriller in space. And I would say once this book kind of got its hooks in me, I could not put it down. In this story, we're introduced to our main character, Asuka, and Asuka is part of a 70 person crew that's been training for like a decade all together and selected from a variety of different countries to basically travel through space to found like a new human civilization on a new planet because Earth is dealing not only with like climate catastrophe, but also war as many different countries are like literally at war with one another, signaling possibly the end of Earth as we know it. This mission is structured into three parts. The first part, every crew member was asleep for the first third of their journey. They're now currently in the middle part where everyone is awake and kind of moving around the spaceship, doing their various jobs that they have been training for. A year into the second part of their journey though, a bomb goes off, resulting in the death of two crewmates. It also sends like conspiracy and suspicion throughout the entire ship. And our main character, Asuka, is essentially put in charge of the investigation to try to figure out who set off this bomb. This book though is structurally written in two parts. We are following the investigation in real time as Asuka is like interviewing and investigating a variety of people and kind of moving through the station, trying to figure out what in the world happened. But we also follow Asuka in the past. As a child, we get to know her with her family. We also get to know her. She makes a decision to enter this very prestigious and difficult training program to possibly be selected for this mission. We see her grow up alongside every single member of this ship who is now under suspicion for possibly setting off a bomb, which adds a very complex wrinkle to the investigation. And we're also just very much in Asuka's mind. And I really appreciated how introspective this book was. Obviously, we have this thriller conspiracy that's taking over the ship. And there's obviously a lot of intensity with that, but I also appreciated how much we got to know Asuka as our main character and her growth and journey too within 
in this book. Asuka herself struggles a lot with her own perception of self. She's incredibly self-conscious. Uh, one, because she was selected as an alternate for this mission, so she doesn't really feel like she belongs amongst the other crew. Alongside that, Asuka is half Japanese, selected to represent Japan on this mission, and she also struggles with her own ideas of identity and culturally where she fits between Japan and America. Overall, I just really appreciated all the different inputs of this book. I was hooked by the mystery. I was really invested in Asuka's story, and I really appreciated the growth and the character elements that were included within this book too. It just had so many different things that I feel like worked so well, and I read it in like two days. I could not put this book down. I would give it like five out of five stars. I loved it. Next book I completed was The Hexologist by Josiah Bancroft. I was already 50% of the way through this book when I picked this book up again. I have no idea why I started and put this book down because honestly, I was loving all the different inputs of the story. I think there was just a lot of books near the end of the year. I got distracted. I was pulled in different directions. But now that I've completed this, I can fully recommend this book because I was delighted by it. This book is set in a fantasy world that I would sort of describe as like a London inspired industrial revolution setting. There's magic in this world and there are four primary schools. There are wizards, alchemists, necromancers, and hexologists. However though, after a very large war, most of the magic has sort of been constrained or reduced in terms of the amount of power people are allowed to have working in those fields. As a result of this, technology and other types of industry have been booming in town and around the world. But obviously there's a lot of negative impacts as it relates to this booming industry. Again, why I sort of connected to the industrial revolution time period. In this book, we're following our two main characters, which are a husband and wife duo who are also private investigators. The wife herself is also a hexologist and like a master within her field of study and magic. At the beginning of this book, they're basically approached by the royal family to help them with a mystery because the king is trying to turn himself into a cake and nobody knows why. While our two main characters, Azolde and Warren, would not consider themselves royalists, they decide to take up this case because they don't want this to sort of create a lot of social unrest in town. But as they begin to investigate, they realize this conspiracy is much larger than they could ever imagine, and the twists and turns of this book are so good. I just love Josiah Bancroft's writing. He has such a way of creating so much whimsy and magic and strangeness that I just adore reading every single time. It somehow like captures the spirit of some aspect of middle grade, but very much making it adult fantasy, and I just adore it. Isolde and Warren, as our main character, root this story so well. They're a fantastic team. I love their dynamic. I love the relationship. I love the humor that exists within the dialogue and between these two characters. I could watch them solve mysteries every single day of the week. Like, I hope this is like a serialized fiction story, and I have 20 books to anticipate and enjoy because I loved this world. I loved the concept of the magic. I loved the setting, the mystery was quite windy and I especially just love like the style of Josiah Bancroft's writing and just sort of the worlds he creates. This was great. I would highly recommend this book and I would give it like a 4.5 out of 5 stars. The last book I was able to complete for this wrap up is Emily Wilde's Map of the Otherlands by Heather Fawcett. This of course is book two, the first one being Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. And I'm happy to say I loved this book even more than the first one. If you want a whimsical, charming, endearing, low spice romance story, this is the book for you. But the fantastic thing about this series is, yes, there's romance. There's also such an amazing fantasy plotline right alongside such amazing characters. I'm just so endeared to this series so much. But in this book, we're introduced to our main character, Emily Wilde. And Emily Wilde is a professor at Cambridge and her specialty is fae and folklore. And at the beginning of book one, she's basically working on her encyclopedia, gathering stories of all of the fae across the land and kind of putting them in one centralized place. She's almost complete. And at book one, she's basically traveling to this like remote town to gather a bit more information. Unfortunately for her, her co-worker Wendell decides to come along. And unfortunately to her, he is kind of her opposite. He's very charismatic. He's very charming. He's very aloof. And they begin to work with one another despite her initial misgivings and they begin to grow close. But they also get wrapped up in a variety of like fairy related issues. 
and I loved it. Book two, we are following our same characters once again, and now we're setting out on a new mystery and a new challenge. I love how Heather Fawcett centers Faye and folklore so well within the story. Structurally, this book is written like Emily's diary, and she's just so knowledgeable. And I love how much Faye world building there is within this book. The Faye plot lines absolutely grip me. They're so well done. And there's even footnotes along the way, because again, Emily is an academic, so she's referencing like a lot of literature or research that she's done in the past to help the reader along the way, and I love it. The mystery in this book honestly hooked me a bit more. I love to see the progression of the relationship between Wendell and Emily too. They're just so cute. I also really appreciated the inclusion of some additional characters, really fleshing out the world even further. I was just delighted. I flew through this. It was charming, cute, romantic, honestly all of the above. The series is just great. It truly has an amazing fantasy plotline a charming, cute romance that's well-paced. That's truly all I want in this world. And I would give this book like a four, 4.5 out of five stars. It was so dang cute. Alrighty guys, that is a wrap up of some of my recent reads. Please comment down below some books you've read recently as I would love to know. And I will see you soon with another video soon. Goodbye.